very much for that introduction, Jill. Um, and thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, uh, as Jill said, I've been working at UKCH uh, since pretty soon after since uh, start finishing my undergraduate degree. Um, so it's been nearly 14 years now. And in this time, I've had the opportunity to work on a really wide variety of um, projects, including seabirds, insect pollinators, um, aquatic plants, fungal pathogens, um, and a whole host of other things. But the majority of my research is focused on trees. And um, last year I was doing a course and we were tasked with um, coming up with six words to summarize what we do for the other participants. And I decided it was a little bit harder than I originally thought to do this, but I decided on how and why do trees vary. So when Jill um, invited me to talk today, I thought that would make quite a nice title. Um, and just as a little reminder, I've stuck in here and why should we care just because I think it's really important Although these kind of things are obvious to me because I work on this all the time, I think it's really important to kind of explain to people why it is that we should care how and why trees vary. Um, and this is because the ability of tree populations to adapt to changes in their environment um, can be assessed by measuring how much trait variation there is, um, how heritable it is, and how plastic it is, i.e. the ability of trees to grow di differently in different environments. And um, as we all know, tree planting is um, one of the big ways in which uh, governments are hoping to get to net zero. And if we don't understand the adaptive potential of the existing tree populations or the tree populations we're going to be planting, then we really don't know how they're going to respond once the environment starts changing. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we go about answering this question, how and why do trees vary? Um, and in particular, how a single trial will enable us to understand so much more about Scott's pine. So really, the title is Using a Multi-Site Progeny Provenance Trial to Better Understand Scott's Spine, but I hope you understand why I, I decided to stick with the snappier title of How and Why Do Trees Vary. Um, I just, from the off, wanted to acknowledge all of these people. This is a long-term multi-site trial. It would not be possible without the um, input of an awful lot of people. And I'm going to put this slide up again at the end, but I just wanted to say from the very start, this, is, um, this has involved a large number of people over a lot of years. So there we go. So what am I actually going to talk about? Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background to Scott's Pine. I'm going to describe the trial and what the assessments are that we do with this trial or these trials. Um, and also what can we learn from it? So um, it's going to be quite a broad overview um, with a few kind of specific examples towards the end. So first of all, Scots Pine, I probably don't need to give too much introduction to the National Tree of Scotland, to the members of the Botanical Society of Scotland, but um, this is more just an excuse to put a nice photo of some Scots Pine. This is Glen Afric um, in, the, in the Highlands. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Scots Pine in Scotland, the Caledonian pine woods. But just to give us some context, you can see that this is the westernmost distribution of Scots Pine in Scotland, but actually Scots pine extends right the way through nearly to the Pacific Ocean. And also latitudinally, it's got this huge, um, a huge uh, range, right from the Arctic Circle all the way down to the Mediterranean. And it's the most widely distributed pine species. Um, and it's a pioneer species which grows particularly well in nutrient poor soils. You can see here, this is um, pine growing in Russia, really nice and tall and straight. But it also does grow in these very boggy environments. This is also in Russia. Um, it, is very, very stunted. It's very, um, and takes a long time to grow a very, very short amount. Um, but you can see it does grow. It's just, it tends to be outcompeted by other species in these very, very wet environments. And it's economically and ecologically a really, really important species. And so the uh, populations that I'm concerned with, um, particularly for this talk, are the Caledonian pinewoods. So there are 84 recognized fragments of pine forest. These vary in size from a few hundred trees or less than a hundred trees actually in some cases, up to many thousands of trees. Some of these sites are national nature reserves. Um, some of them are sites of special scientific interest or special areas of conservation. And a few of these are also being recognized as genetic conservation units because the genetic diversity of the pines that we have in Scotland is different from anywhere else in the world. Um, in total, there's only about 18,000 hectares of this Caledonian pinewood remaining in Scotland. And so they're protected areas. The UK has an obligation to 
uh, protect and restore these pine woods. Well, restoration and regeneration in Caledonian pine woods is, is quite problematic. Browsing by deer is a major problem. Um, the trees are vulnerable until they're at least two meters tall. And the only way really to deal with this is by um, deer fencing or management of deer numbers. Um, and you can see here that um, this is also at Glen Effort, that where there's no deer fence, there's no regeneration at all. And then here's a deer fence and you have lots and lots, but um, fencing is expensive. You have to maintain it. Um, so it's sort of done in, in patches in these pine woods. I mentioned that it's an economically important species as well. In the UK, it comprises about 17% of the total forest, conifer forest, which is just under 10% of the total forest area. Um, the wood is mostly used for fencing and panelling, and it grows well, particularly well in areas which are too dry for citrus spruce. And it's thought that it will become increasingly important as the climate changes, and it's unsuitable for some, uh, some species that we use. So what do we know already about these populations? And I mentioned that they have this unique genetic diversity that's not found anywhere else. And part of this might be due to the, um, the habitat. So we've got in Scotland, as anyone who has lived in Scotland or traveled around knows, we have this hugely spatially heterogeneous environment, which means that on the west coast of Scotland, you get about three times as much rainfall as on the east, and it's also a lot warmer. So the populations that have evolved in these areas have um, evolved to deal with very different, um, different climatic conditions. And we know, for example, when these trees from these different populations are grown in a common environment down here in Edinburgh, that we see quite a lot of differences in things like needle morphology and phenology. For example, um, there's uh, populations from the west have more stomatal rows than those in the east. Um, the populations in the east have more resin canals needle density is much higher in the west than the east. And we also see differences like cold hardiness is much worse in western populations than in the east. Growth initiation and bud burst also happen earlier in the east than the west. So these experiments were all done in a common environment and they were also all in pots. And so I think part of the impetus for getting this trial going was um, the desire to plant trees and see them, uh, measure them, um, analyze them over a much longer period of time. Because obviously in pots, you have a very specific, um, different sort of environment than you would expect to see once things are planted. So I'm just going to introduce the trial then. First of all, I use this term progeny provenance trial in the title, and I'm not a big fan of jargon, but it's actually a pretty straightforward term. Progeny just means the offspring. And provenance is another word for saying population. So it just means the site of origin. So each of those um, 84 Caledonian pine woods is an individual provenance, or it's, we, we consider it an individual provenance. So what I mean by a progeny provenance trial is, um, for example, we've got two provenances here, A and B, and there are trees which are growing in those provenances, um, two in each of those here. And if we go to provenance A, for example, and we collect, collect cones, um, and then grow the seed, then all of the trees that grow from seed collected from a single tree are considered a family. And all of these trees we know share at least a mother because we collected them all from the same tree. And so we can say they're at least half siblings. Possibly um, we don't, unless you do genetic analysis to, to resolve the paternity, you don't know that, but the assumption is they're at least half siblings. And so these are the trees that we include in our trial. So these are the progeny and these are the provenances. And can, we can use what we know about um, genetic variation and genetic similarity to say that within a family, these trees should be more closely related and more genetically similar than trees within a provenance, but from different families. And trees from different provenances are likely to be even less genetically similar. And having a progeny provenance structure allows us to measure the genetic contribution to trait variation. So what that means is that if we see variation in a trait, then we can start to partition what is due to genetic variance by looking to see how that variant, the variation in the trait differs within a family and among families. So the trial itself then, so seed was collected, 
uh, from uh, 21 of the 84 populations in 2007. So that's a quarter of the um, Caledonian pinewoods. And from each of these 21 populations, um, 10 trees were visited and cones were collected from 10 trees from each. So in total, we have 210 families. Um, by July 2007, the seedlings were growing in one of three nurseries. So we've got one here up in the northwest of Scotland, and we've got one in the east of Scotland here. This is all, both of these are outside nurseries. And then we've got another one growing near Aberdeen in the east of Scotland, but this one is in a glass house. And there are 40 of these blocks. Um, this is just the term we use to describe all the trees growing in a more similar environment. So it helps us to understand how um, the environment might affect the growth of these, even over a relatively small area as the trees growing within a single nursery. And each of these blocks has two trees from each population. And in total, each of the nurseries is represented by um, each family with eight trees. So there's eight trees per family in each nursery. And in 2012, um, a subset of each of these trees, uh, each of the trees from the nurseries were transplanted to field sites. Now I should say um, there was about 5,000 trees in total growing at the three nurseries. Um, and it wasn't possible to plant out this many in the field sites. So I think there's about um, 670 trees at, um, at Glensoch here in the east of Scotland, down here in the borders, and there's about 500 trees growing um, up in the west of Scotland. So the trees that were planted down in um, the borders all came from the glass house. The, so in Aberdeen, the trees from the glass house were used to plant um, tree, uh, the site down in the borders. Um, the site, the field site in the east of Scotland, and the vast majority came from the uh, nursery that was local to it. And the remaining few, I think there was only four trees in total, came from the glass house nearby. Now there was a problem, all the trees from the, uh, that were gonna be planted in the west of Scotland were originally supposed to be growing in the same nursery locally, but there was unexpected browsing by deer. Um, and that meant that there weren't sufficient numbers to, to plant them all from a local nursery. And for that reason, um, just over 50% of the trees came locally. Um, about a quarter came from the um, glass house and the remaining trees were grown outside in the nursery um, in the east of Scotland. And that has implications, um, which I'll mention later, but just to give you a sort of bit of background about that. So the trees are transplanted once um, they are about five years old. And you can see here, this is Glensoch in Aberdeenshire um, in the east of Scotland. This is uh, in the U in the Highlands, really beautiful location. And this is Yair yeah, in the borders. And you can see these are the trees when they were first planted in 2012. And this photo was taken last summer. So you can see the trees are really well established now. Um, they're between about three and five meters tall. Um, and they're, yeah, they're doing really, really well. So the title of my talk was How and Why Do Trees Vary? And the how is actually quite straightforward. So what we do is we measure the trees um, for a whole range of traits. Um, we might be interested in growth, so looking at height and stem diameter, or tree form, which might be canopy width or number of buds or number of branches. Um, phenology, which is the study of cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena, um, so for example, bud burst, timing, duration, um, or growth cessation. Um, interested in the associated communities with the trees, so the insects and the endophytes. Um, the damage that we see to the trees. So once they're planted out, um, we might see variation in the susceptibility to pests or pathogens, and also things like snow damage. Um, there's reproductive traits, so um, things like the abundance, um, and presence or absence, um, and also age at first, pollen, flower production, cones, things like that. Um, there's also the biochemistry of the needles, so a huge number of um, things can be measured, um, for example, nitrogen, sucrose, or phenolic acids that are found in the needles. And also the genetic variation. So um, a subset of the trees in the trial have been um, what we call genotyped, which means that we've sequenced them to see how they vary at about 40,000 locations in the genome. Now, some of these are done um, in the nursery, which is the N, 
Some of them are done in the field, some of them are done in both. Um, some of these are done over multiple years, so height and stem diameter and bud bursts are done over multiple years. Um, and some of them are done at all of the sites and some of them are just done at one of the sites. Um, so we basically have this huge amount of data that we've been collecting um, and um, over a long period of time as well. Um, and this is just a little selection of photos to show you how we go about doing this. So trusty clipboard, observational um, recordings of things like susceptibility, so estimated percentage of the uh, tree, which is susceptible to showing signs of infection. We might look at stages of bud burst. So um, according to what point they've reached, um, or we might look at things like flowers, just again, observations. And we also use things like measuring poles or tapes to actually physically measure the things. And some of those uh, for genetic um, variation, for example, where we have to do DNA extractions or for the biochemistry, we actually have to take samples of the needles and take those back to the lab. We're also been recently exploring the use of drones to do some of this data collection. So this was in October last year. This is um, a new uh, drone that is uh, operated by Paul Schofield, who works down at CEH in um, Lancaster. Um, and you can see here, this is the screen, and each of these little dots here is one of our trees. You can see it from the aerial view. So he did a sort of pilot fly over the site, just in order for us to get an idea of what we might actually be able to use drones for. And this is just a little video showing the drone landing. And you can see these are our trees here. And um, the drone that Paul uses has three different cameras. cameras. So it's got LiDAR, um, and this is a device which can really accurately measure distance by using a laser. It's got multispectral, so um, you can uh, look at different wavelengths of light. And photogrammetry, which is like very high res color photography. And you can see, for example, here, there's a tree which is completely dead um, when it picks it up really nicely. So by Flying over three times and getting all this data from those three different cameras, you can then lay um, each of the files on top of each other and um, start to build a picture of um, things like the height of the trees. This was just a sort of a test to see how well this would work. And what um, Paul does is overlay a grid um, based on where we've told him our trees should be. And each of these dots is where the computer program has recognized that there's a tree there. And then it measures the height from the LiDAR. And what I did was look at the height that Paul estimated from the LIDAR for each of our trees, and I compared it with the observed height that we had. Um, and you can see it's a really, really nice, strong correlation, which means that LIDAR is doing a really good job at identifying the trees and getting the height. There are a few spots here which um, are a little bit out. That's probably because of things like um, vegetation, which is confusing things. It was measured in October, and surrounding vegetation was still quite high. And it might also be things like because of the snow damage earlier on in the year, the trees might have fallen down a little bit and we've counted as still as that height, but the LIDAR has measured it from its sort of tallest point instead. So there's a little bit of refinement to be done, but it's shown really real promise. So back to the title of my talk then, um, I've sort of dealt with how do trees vary and how we go about measuring that. So why do they vary then? Um, and it, simply, it's a case of nature versus nurture, which I'm sure everyone's heard of. Um, trees might vary because of their environment. So for example, their climate that they're in or the exposure to pests and pathogens. And they might vary because of their genetic variation as well. And the structure of our trial, having both multiple sites and being a progeny provenance trial allows us to separate each of those things if you want to. So by growing things in a single environment, we can say, that the amount of the genetic variation should be minimized. So most of the variation that we see should be because of the genetic variation. And similarly, if we grow the same trees, or they can't, they're not clones, but because we've got these families, so they're very genetically similar trees, but in multiple environments, differences we see across sites should be because of the environment and not because of the genetic variation. So some of the reasons that trees might vary then we can, because we've got multiple environments, we can look at things like phenotypic plasticity. So this is the um, ability of trees to grow differently in different environments. 
um, because we're measuring things over multiple years, we can look to see how much impact temporal um, variation has. Um, because we're measuring multiple traits, we can start to look at the interaction among traits as well. Um, and because they're grown in a nursery environment, we might look to see um, what impact early environment effects have. Um, and as I mentioned, because we've got this progeny provenance structure, it allows us to look at things like local adaptation. We can also, because we've got a family structure, we can look at heritability. Um, and when we sequence um, the uh, genetic variation, we can also start to associate genetic variation with a variation among traits and start to sort of try and identify um, particular genetic markers that might be um, underlying variation. So I'm just going to go through a few preliminary results. Um, I want to point out that apart from one slide, um, the following results are unpublished and they haven't been peer reviewed. And um, I mostly just um, did some analysis because I thought it would be quite nice to put some results of what we're looking at, but we're still in the early stages of analyzing these data and um, we're just starting to write it up as well. So any mistakes that are made or any interpretations um, are mine. And uh, yeah, so until they're published, please bear that in mind. So I mentioned that we can look at things like temporal variation. Now, I mean, this is fairly common sense. If we have, for example, a really, really cold spring, then we see a delay in things like flowering. I mean, everyone knows that from looking around. But what this kind of trial does is enable us to actually measure that. So what we've got here is the mean temperature, mean minimum temperature, sorry, in April, and then the mean number of days to reach bud burst. So how long it takes until the needles starting to emerge from the, from the buds. And you can see that you have much later bud burst when the April is much colder. Now, as I said, that's really, really common sense. You would kind of assume that. But what these sorts of results do is enable us to actually get values for that. What are the actual effects of having a different temperatures? And this is really useful because you can use it in modeling. Um, so if we know how Scott's pine responds to the current climate, we can start to model how, for example, higher temperatures might affect things like phenology. So by having actual values, these can be input into models and they can give us a much more accurate idea of what, um, how species like Scott's pine might respond in the future. Um, so another thing that we can use these trials for is looking at local adaptation. So local adaptation is basically where trait variation correlates with environment at the site of origin. So rather than having so much to do with variation, say temporally, you're saying, okay, what is the trait variation and how does that link in with what we know about where those trees originally come from? Now, the um, winter, just uh, not the last one, the one before, we had some quite prolonged periods of heavy snowfall. And when I was visiting the site in, I think it was March last year, I noticed that a lot of these trees had this kind of bending of the branches where presumably the heavy snowfall had been sitting on it and it kind of damaged the branch. And I thought it would be interesting because I saw that not all of the trees had this to make a note of them. So for each of the trees I went around, this is, sorry, this is the site in the borders. Um, because the trees have been growing for the same amount of time, they should have the same number of whorls. And so I went for each tree, I just made a note of how many whorls on each tree had this kind of damage on it. And then for each of the populations, I just measured, I, I calculated the mean number of whorls, the average number of whorls which had damage. And you can see then that you have much less damage, so fewer worlds are damaged in populations which come from air, uh, come in populations which have much colder winters. So this is a measure of how cold it is in February. And so that's an indication that these populations, which have evolved in areas which are much colder and which are therefore assumed to have much higher chance of things like snowfall those populations have evolved to be less damaged when snowfall happens. Now, I don't know what the mechanism of this is. This was just a kind of, I thought this looked quite interesting. And so I did a quick check of it. It might be something to do with the form of the trees. They might be less branchy and therefore they hold the snow less. Um, it might be that they hold fewer needles and therefore the snow drops off much more easily. Or it might be that they're actually physically stronger against the snowfall, but it's an interesting finding anyway. 
And understanding local adaptation helps us to understand trees' evolutionary history, so where they came from. And it also gives us an idea of their comparative vulnerability to different pressures, which is really interesting and really useful if we want to understand how they're going to respond in the future. So phenotypic plasticity, I mentioned this before, it's kind of, I find it always a little bit difficult to get my head around these things, but basically it's the ability of trees to respond differently to different environments. So if a tree always grows the same, no matter where it's planted, or if a tree um, is able to respond to the environment it's planted in differently. So if a tree always grows the same, it's not very plastic. Um, so RDPI is basically, uh, it's a measure of plasticity. And you can see here, that the height of the trees, so how plastic their height is, is higher in populations from the east of Scotland. Now this um, x-axis here is longitude. Now longitude covers a whole multitude of different parameters. So I've got things, got a couple marked on here. So annual precipitation is where the dots are much smaller and the growing season length. So populations from the east have much lower annual precipitation and much shorter growing seasons. And you can see that these populations are much more plastic in their height. And um, one hypothesis for this is that um, trees from populations with harsher environments have evolved a much more conservative growth strategy. So it means that when they're growing in, in, in unfavorable environments, they tend to grow much more slowly um, overall. But it looks like they're able to respond so that when conditions are favorable, they are able to grow much faster. So they're more plastic in, in unfavorable environments, they grow slowly, grow shorter, but in environments which are warmer or comparatively more favorable, they're able to respond to that and to grow more effectively. Um, and in contrast, you can see these populations from the west of Scotland, which have much more favorable environments, they've got a longer growing season and more water availability, they're less plastic. And you might, first off think that um, trees which are able to grow really well in unfavorable environments, and that's a good thing. But actually that might be proved to be a disadvantage over time in harsher environments where slow growth might actually be beneficial. So understanding phenotypic plasticity is of key importance in understanding how trees might respond to a change in climate, and also how effective they might be as part of a breeding population if we can understand how they might respond to being planted in different environments. So I mentioned that we're measuring a whole multitude of traits, and this means that we can start to look at trait interaction. And this is where we look at correlation of traits, and this might be positive correlations or it might be negative. So an example here is bud burst being correlated with height increment in the following year. And we can see that trees which bud burst bud earlier also put on more height the following year. Now, one of the explanations for this might be that trees which burst bud earlier have an effectively longer growing season. And this means that they are able to put more resources into growing taller in that um, growing season. Um, that's one interpretation. It might be that there are other factors involved, um, but this is what we can start to do when we look at trait interactions. Understanding how traits interact can allow us to see trees responses more holistically because Coming back to modeling, when we want to model how trees are going to respond to changing climates, if we just look at one trait, that's not realistic. Traits interact in all kinds of different ways. And so we want to understand how that might work. And it also might mean that we use one trait as a proxy for another if we know they're really tightly linked. Now, I mentioned about early environment effects and how trees which were planted in the Northwest of Scotland and the MBU actually came from all three different nurseries. And this can have all kinds of complications to it once we started looking into it, because the three nurseries, as you might imagine, um, the trees didn't grow in quite the same way in all three environments. As you might expect, trees which grew in a glass house were taller. This is their mean height, the dotted line. The trees in a gla glass house grew taller than either of the trees from outside environments, either from the one in the east west coast of Scotland, which might be considered more favourable, or in the east coast. And so this meant that these trees, you might expect them to have a head start. They've been better provisioned over this period. And therefore we might expect those trees to always grow taller or to, to sort of have that head start, which means that they can then grow taller throughout. And actually when we look 
each of these lines here is the tree height um, over the period from after they were planted in 2013 up until last year. Um, and you can see that trees which came from this high provision in glasshouse environment, um, although, like we said, first of all, they're much taller, over time, they're overtaken in height by trees which came from a local nursery. So ones which have already been adapted to that environment because they were planted, uh, because they were growing nearby. And we can see that this is because apart from this very first year after planting, the height increments of the amount they put on in height each year was tall, was more, was greater in that nursery adapted um, set of trees than in either ones which were going in the glass house or ones which were in, um, in the Eastern nursery. And the other two nurseries have very comparative growth. You would, like I say, expect the glass house trees to be sort of advantaged, but actually their height is, is about the same as trees which are grown in a sort of much less favorable environment. Apart from this first year, and this is possibly because of that provisioning, it had sort of a head start in that one year, but every year after, trees which were grown locally had a, that advantage, that, that growth advantage. And this sort of finding, I'm just trying to pick this apart at the moment, actually, but this sort of finding is really important in understanding how and where to grow trees in a nursery environment. And using a nursery is really common practice for replanting, for conservation, as well as for commercial purposes. So if we can understand that use of a local nursery has really quite dramatic impact on the growth of those trees, this might then change where people um, consider getting their trees from in the future. Um, so how else can we use the trial then? Um, this is an example of how we use genomics to forecast traits, so how we might use them to do trait prediction. So just a bit of background as to what this is then. Um, first of all, to do this, you need trees which are grown in a common environment, which we have, and we need to measure traits of interest, which we've been doing. You then want to genotype the trees, and genotyping basically just means to sequence them for different genetic markers. So this is an example of one genetic marker, and these are each individual trees, and they might be have the code CC, or they might have AA, or they might be intermediate and have AC. And if we then look at how the trait associates with their genotype, with the variation at these markers, we can start to identify some markers which might be associated with this trait variation. So an example here is tall trees have this AA, and small trees are CC. And by building up different markers, which, which are able to um, be used to, um, or which have these associations with them, allows us to build prediction models where we select just those markers which are informative, and we use those to um, predict what the, uh, for example, what the height of trees will be based on what we already know about what the markers show us from the, this sort of training population of trees. Ideally, then you then validate it in an independent set of trees, which has also been genotyped, so has also been um, sequenced for those same genetic markers, and has also been measured for the same trait. And ideally, what you do is you do a prediction where you say, we, this is what the, the model says those trees are going to be, and the predicted height will correlate really nicely with the observed height. That's the hope. So this is a paper that was published uh, just last month, where we um, used um, a glasshouse trial of three, tri uh, three pine species to build these um, mark trait associations and build these predictive models. And the predictive model for height that, um, that we generated was then tested on the uh, Scots pine that were growing in these independent trials. So the trials, well, actually was um, down in the borders. And you can see here that um, here is the predicted value and the observed value. So we can see, although it's not really, really strong, it's still a significantly positive association between what their observed height is and what their predicted height is. And because we've got this correlation, which says that this predictive model has some power to predict what height is going to be, we also tested to see how it could get used. And one of the ways in which this kind of model could be useful is to enable us to do what's called genomic selection, which means that rather than selecting trees, seedlings, for example, based on how they perform 
you actually all you need to do is um, is to sequence their variation at these different um, markers and you can predict their height and then selection can be based on their predicted height and so the way we did this was to select the 10 tallest trees based on their predicted value and then this plot basically shows this genomic selection selecting the 10 tallest trees based on what we predicted their value was going to be was compared against this dotted line here is the mean height so the average height of all trees in this trial and you can see that when we use genomic selection the average height of those trees this dark line here is um i can't remember what the exact thing is it was about um well it was it was taller anyway seven percent i think it was taller than the average height in the trial and that is equivalent to about one or over one meter of height if you assume that this is going to be then harvested at between 20 and 23 meters. So basically, if we use genomic selection using the predictive model that we, we um, generated, that we uh, built, then we would see an equivalent height gain once we harvested those trees. Now, in comparison, if we used a phenotype selection, so that's where you um, you choose the 10 tallest trees based on what their height is when they're seedling, so when they're one year old, then you actually see those trees are shorter overall than the average height of trees in the trial. So it's, it's both much more effective than the average height and also much more effective than selecting it based on um, their, their height at a young age. And these trait prediction models are useful for accelerating breeding trials but also for understanding the adaptive potential of natural tree populations. Um, and how else, I'll just um, do one more slide here to show how else we might um, use the trial. Um, another example is to deep dive into variation. So an example here is susceptibility to, to disease. Um, this disease here is called Duffelstroma needle blight. And um, once the trees were planted in 2012, um, we found that they quite quickly became infected. This, this pathogen is found right the way across um, Scotland. And so it sort of provided a natural experiment. So since 2015, I've been measuring susceptibility to this pathogen. And because I've been measuring it um, every year in all these different environments, um, it means we can already start to build a picture of how the trait varies temporally, like I said. Um, and across the trial itself. So we can start to look at things like the um, heritability of susceptibility to disease. Um, other ways in which we can look at it, we can have been taking needles from the trees and artificially um, inoculating them with the pathogen in the lab to see if their response in this detached needle assay is similar to in the field. Another thing you can do is to um, take the needles which are infected and grow the pathogen and you can also look at the um, variation in the pathogen across the trial. And because we've got it at all three trial sites, um, you can look across um, that, those different environments as well. I mentioned trait interaction. We see that trees which are more susceptible to Dothostroma um, are uh, shorter overall. So this can start to give us a bit more of an idea about um, what makes trees more susceptible and also then to get, have a better understanding of how we might um, use that information for growing trees which are both um, grow better but also which uh, which are less susceptible to disease. Um, this here is just a plot showing um, a technique called Fourier transform infrared uh, spectroscopy which I never remember the word the name of but it basically is where you look to see the absorbance spectrum and in this case, we've got trees which are resistant to, to Dothostroma and trees which are susceptible. And we try and then pick out to see if we can find different signatures of um, susceptibility of depending on what their absorbance is. And another thing that we can do is um, sequence. So each of these is a, is a genotype, an individual, each of these rows is an individual. And we can look for associations between um, the traits, so susceptibility, and also um, their genetic variation. So having these long-term trials enables us to really, really go in depth into this kind of trait. So um, I hope that was um, a bit of a 
whistle stop tour summary of why, um, well, first of all, how and why trees vary, but also why it's important that we find this kind of um, information. Um, I said I'd put this slide up again. I want to particularly acknowledge Stephen, Joan and Glenn, um, who conceived and set up the trial. Um, and also I want to say special thanks to Joan Beaton, um, who has just, well, she's also been um, involved in the trial since the very beginning with Glenn, and she has been endlessly helpful and supportive of my continual requests for data, for information, for photos, for backgrounds on why certain things were done and when they were done. So thank you. And thank you for your attention. And um, I think Jill mentions that you can put questions into the Q&A bit at the bottom, but um, yeah, happy to answer. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't switched the video on, um, and I'd, I had unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I was just saying, I don't know who heard that or not. So thank you very much, Annika. It was a fascinating talk, and uh, how important those kind of trials are, and especially to have them going on long term. So we do have a couple of questions in the Q and A. Uh, please, can I, people write their questions there? Um, one of the questions was, how do the soil properties vary between the sites? And how do you take account of this when you're interested in more other environmental variables? It's a really good question. I wish I had an excellent answer lined up. I know that um, soil cores were taken from each of the sites. And as the um, person who asked the question um, is pointing out, they were really, really different. Um, how we take into account, I guess that's just a big part of what makes the sites different. It's the climate that they have, their aspects, the soil conditions. Um, yeah, it's it's just another part of it. So um, I'm not quite sure that's a great answer for it. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a factor. Yes, that was from from Tom Parker, sorry. Uh, maybe he could get in touch with you later and, and find out more about that. I imagine that it could be incorporated into the multiple analyses you're doing to tease out what effect this, the soil values might have if you have the um, soil information, it's really good. Um, Trevor Fenning noted that um, mat um, maternal imprinting has been well established for conifers. Um, and he wondered where the cones were formed being influential and overriding formal genetic factors. And so we have epigenetic effects and he wondered what influence that might have on your results. Yeah, no, it's really true. Um, I think, yeah, so um, it's really hard unless you experimentally look at, as far as I'm aware anyway, my understanding is that unless you experimentally um, influence the environment that the um, mother trees are experiencing, then it's quite hard to separate that from just the general environment. And like I said, those uh, the trees were selected all in 2007. And although some measurements were taken of the trees, things like you know their height and their girth and um, competition that was nearby, and I think a few other things like peak depth, um, and measurements were taken on the cones as well. So their weight and the seed weight and things like that. The actual, we could look at what the environmental um, factors were influencing the seed development, for example, during when the cones were um, on the tree, which is generally, I think, when, um, when you might see epigenetic effects in the offspring. Um, but it's very hard to disentangle that from the provenance effect as well. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's one I've been thinking about quite a lot recently because of this whole nursery effect as well. Um, is this evidence of an epigenetic effect or is it something physiological? Um, I, yeah. Again, sorry, that's probably not a very satisfying answer. But yes, I, I wondered when the trees were selected for to take the cones from. How did you decide which tree to collect them from? Were they the, the best trees or the 
the easiest trees to collect from or was there anything um i wasn't in, about that? yeah it's a good point i wasn't involved in the um the seed collection um but i have a feeling that the same trees have been used in previous experiments i that i, I would need to check that and therefore it was kind of um it was a nice way of having continuity with different projects as well um yeah possibly availability of cones i mean you tend to go for trees which have a lot of cones which might skew your sample a little bit as well then um and the accessibility of the cones as well tends to i mean i've been involved in in selecting trees which have cones before and that tends to be quite a big factor is can you reach them <laughs> um yeah well it's yet another thing to put into your analysis mm -hmm. uh, I, I like this idea that you said all you need to do is and there's really an awful lot of things you need to do <laughs> so um matthew reese um said thanks that was really interesting but he missed the acronym for the measure of the phenotypic plasticity and how oh, it was measured um i hope i've got this right so rdpi is the relative distance plasticity index and it turns out there's quite a lot of different ways to measure plasticity and that's one which is considered a sort of fairly robust um method so i use that but yeah generally you're looking to see how much trees vary um within sites and then among sites as well okay thank you um, martin says uh it was an amazing talk thank you so interesting to hear and so well explained the trees were planted quite close together was that for forestry purposes and is the whole experiment generally more for forestry than conservation um, I mean, my interest is is more for conservation, but there is definitely um, uh, in there's definitely an enthusiasm for trying to make sure that we can um, make use of local material for forestry as well. I think we're all quite keen that that's encouraged, and Scots pine um, is used in place of more exotic pine or more exotic um, conifer. Um, the trees were planted close together mostly because, I mean, they were three meters apart and you saw how tiny they were when they were first planted. And um, that was chosen as a good distance to allow them to grow. I mean, they're now 15 years old, I think, um, and the canopies haven't closed, so they'll be able to grow for a little bit longer. Um, and they'll also be able to be thinned um, and the design of the trial will stay intact. That was kind of taken into account when designing it. So um, I think the traits that we're measuring and the populations that we're using have interest and applicability for both forestry and for conservation. So um, I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. Great. Um, Clementine says, thanks a lot, very interesting. And she was wondering how or if mortality was taken into account in the trials. Um, so yeah, it's a good point. So mortality in the nursery was, um, was looked at. Um, but by the time they were planted, there was fairly low mortality. I know that at the site in BU, I'm pretty sure they had higher mortality. The site in the borders, we've not had too much. Um, and we've seen a little bit more in the last year as a result of this kind of continual exposure to the stroma. But only those really, really, you know, quite small trees that never were able to grow out of it have been affected. So um, it's, it's probably, mortality isn't high enough, to be honest, to be a, significant factor in the analysis um but in the nursery environment definitely because yeah mortality was particularly high i think in again in, in the u but i'd have to check that mm -hmm. so what are the plans for this um experiment is it long term and how are you going to manage it as the trees grow bigger um so the plan is to carry on measuring it we're still getting so much useful data and as i said you know we're we're getting an awful lot i'm really really just starting to get to the point where we've got a chance to analyze it properly and start to write it up um we've been taking measurements in the field very regularly since 2015 so i guess um the longer we can do that probably in time we'll start to not do it every year but maybe kind of alternate but there are so many traits that we can look at um, as I mentioned, we'll be able to thin the trees. So once the canopy starts to close and competition kind of increases among the trees, we'll be able to thin them. 
and it won't affect the design of the trial. Obviously, we'll have fewer trees, but it will keep that progeny provenance structure intact. Um, so I think Glenn designed that with that in mind. Um, so yeah, we'll keep going, I think. Well, that, that's good. That's good to know. So Martin said, uh, thank you very much uh, for answering his question. That's good to hear. And he wondered if the results are likely to be transferable to other tree species, for example. Mm -hmm. birds. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. I think we use Scots pine um, because we do tend to, our group has been working on Scots pine for a long time, which means that we've got some really, really in-depth knowledge about it, more so than other species. Um, and the kind of model that we've used for um, projects is that we use what we know about Scots pine, obviously to inform what, what we do on Scots pine, but also to inform other species as well, where we might only have kind of more select bits of information. So um, it's always, I mean, to be honest, that's more of a job for modelers and people rather than for me, who is much more involved in the sort of hands-on um, doing that sort of trial work. Um, yeah, they tend to be people who can extrapolate to different species um, based on what we know about them. But certainly it is um, a factor that we are keen to kind of try and encourage is to use Scots pine as a model and not just to see it standing alone just for the results we've seen just in the Scots pine. Well, I guess this experiment will help streamline future experiments on other species so we won't have to do everything all over again and then you may be able to pick, pick out some genetic traits so your next job Annika is to set up a new trial with some different species I think. Um, uh, somebody from BSBI is asking a more general question about Scots pine and Dothostroma. Do you think we should be worried about our native pine woods and the Dothostroma? Are we going to see things like has happened to ash where so many of the trees have died? Um, my feeling is probably not. Um, it seems to be that Scots pine has kind of a big impact when trees are very, very small, when they find it hard to grow out of that sort of surrounding vegetation. And it means that that environment is really conducive for infection because um, it, it kind of promotes really high humidity. There's not very much wind flow. Um, and that's all an environment that's really, really nice for the pathogen. So while trees are very small, we tend to see quite high levels of infection and it might have quite a bad effect on them. But it's certainly not, as far as we can see, having anywhere near the kind of impact that something like ash dieback is. Um, partly we think that's because it's not a native, uh, sorry, it's not a purely exotic pathogen. We found evidence that it's been kind of co-evolving with populations of Scots pine with the native pine woods. Um, and that means that the susceptibility isn't kind of uniformly, um, well, the trees aren't uniformly very susceptible. Um, and as soon as you see variation in susceptibility, that means that there is adaptive potential. That means that those populations have the potential to adapt to that environment, i.e. high inoculum pressure, uh, lots of pathogens. So, so yes, we think that they're probably already um, there's already this selection pressure going on in the background, which means that um, the trees which are regenerating, we're hoping are already showing signs of adaptation um, to that environment. Um, that's one of the things we're going to be experimenting actually in a, in a current project that we've got going on at the moment, looking to see whether um, uh, regenerating populations um, are showing signs of um, increased susceptibility, uh, sorry, increased lower susceptibility to the pathogen. Um, so yeah, I don't think native pine woods, I've, I've been around um, the native pine woods kind of trying to sample for things like this. And although you do see it, it's not kind of overwhelming the trees. You just, it's just kind of everywhere, but not at a really, really high um, pressure, I don't think at the moment. Oh, well, that's good, that's good to hear. Uh, Trevor Fenning has added that, um, uh, maybe you don't have to do all the work on the other species because there's, uh, similar results already well known from other species, for example, Pisces arbies. <coughs> Sorry. So there's still plenty of work to do, but you don't have to do all the species. Um, Patricia asks if the Scottish climate becomes even more oceanic on the West Coast, do you think it would be able to extrapolate your findings to learn anything useful in that context? 
Yeah, so this is what we're interested in is um, kind of constantly looking to see uh, how the results that we are getting might be used to inform about changing environment, changing climate. Um, and yeah, I think it will be interesting. I mean, we've said already that um, it's uh, Scots Pine prefers drier soils. Um, and so with increasing wetness, I mean, as I said, it, it can grow where it's wetter, but it does tend to be outcompeted. And the Caledonian pinewoods on the west kind of evolved. I think they're sometimes even called rainforests because they're called, but they're, they're evolved to deal with much higher rainfall. Um, whether that will continue as the it gets even wetter will be really interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, I think what we're interested in is whether they've got that potential. And if, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, the experiments being done with things like water logging in Scots Pine, and it's really, really quite hard to kill them. Um, same with droughting as well, they just kind of carry on going. So um, yeah, it's kind of all of these experiments contribute to a better understanding of them, definitely. Well, that, that sounds promising. If the um, if if the tree if the species is is a very adaptable and can be grown in lots of different conditions. So, just this one last question to end with. Um, John Dick says, "What a wonderful presentation, Annika. How long do you think it will be before the drone will be able to do the sequence of the tree as well as everything else?" <laughs> wow, um, I'm definitely not the person to ask about that. I'm afraid. So you can get um, tools which you can do sort of um, sequencing in the field. They're not, um, they don't do it anywhere near like what you can do when you, you get them back in a lab, but yeah, who knows how long that'll be. Um, yeah, I mean. Well, we can always hope, Annika. <laughs> we're already able to collect just this insane amount of detail and information just from you know, in comparison to a few years ago, the, the drone exam, drone testing that we've done has been really impressive. So, um, yeah, who knows? John, I think you need to suggest it to Paul Schofield <laughs> and he could be uh, up with the, in the forefront of all this knowledge. So I'd like to thank Annika very much for her talk. It was very interesting. You can see the engagement with the, the number of people involved and the questions that have been answered. So that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to remind people to, to uh, look out for the next talk, which is on the 17th of March. And we still don't know whether this will be Zoom or in person. Um, it's not just a COVID situation at the moment. Um, I know the restrictions are being lifted, but the, the RBG had a lot of damage during one of the storms um, to the roof and with water. So it might still be that unless uh, if COVID restrictions ease, we might still not be able to go there, but we are considering another venue. So thank you all to the participants and thank you once again to Annika for, for a wonderful talk. Thanks, Good Jill. night. Good night.